Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman here in our Northwest Side studio. And I'm Amanda Vinicky live in Waukegan. On the show tonight, can the U.S. economy rebound while consumers remain fearful? How doctors are using plasma from recovered COVID-19 patients? Golfing reopens in parts of Illinois. Advice on safeguarding kids' emotional well-being during the pandemic and the Old Town School of Folk Music adapts to changing times. But first, Brandis Parashutz has the night off, and as I mentioned, I will be co-anchoring, co -anchoring, that is, live tonight from far north suburban Waukegan. It is a diverse community with an industrial past. It's also a place that's a hotbed for COVID-19. But first, Brandis, back to you for some of today's top developments. Amanda, we'll see you soon. Illinois officials say they have another sign that the state may be flattening the curve. The state's death toll from COVID-19 is the lowest it's been in 15 days, with 46 deaths reported today. Illinois now has a total of 2,662 coronavirus deaths. There are more than 2,000 new cases of coronavirus reported in the state, bringing the statewide total number of cases to nearly 64,000. And City of Chicago reached a sobering milestone of 1,000 COVID-19 deaths yesterday. Mayor Lori Lightfoot says social distancing is here for the foreseeable future. Otherwise, Chicago will be plunged back into the worst of the pandemic. Illinois stay at home order doesn't officially lift until the end of the month, but Governor J.B. Pritzker says he'll outline the state's reopening plan before May 30th. The governor says reopening Illinois should not be based on an arbitrary date, should instead be based on the number of declining cases and the number of available hospital beds across the state. What we want to make sure is that we were able to handle a spike because that's what, you know, potentially could occur if we reopen things too fast. And as to the setting a date, it sounds like uh, another governor set a date for. I will say that it really needs to be based on data and metrics. Indiana lifted some restrictions today, moving into stage two of its reopening plan with retail and commercial businesses, along with shopping malls opening at 50% capacity. Indiana's restaurants, hair salons, and tattoo parlors will reopen next week on a limited basis. Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb is aiming to reopen Indiana by July 4th. Illinois' marijuana dispensaries, which are considered essential services and have remained open during the pandemic, had near record sales in April. More than $37 million of legal weed was sold last month. That brings Illinois sales to more than $147 million since recreational sales started on January 1st. That's when the sales record was set at a little more than $39 million. And hopes for another outdoor summer music festival have fallen flat. The Grant Park Music Festival has canceled its entire 2020 summer season. The festival, which started in 1935, is a free summertime celebration of music in Millennium Park and other venues across the city. The Grant Park Music Festival has a $7.2 million annual operating budget, and officials are anticipating a 60% drop in revenues. The festival received nearly $700,000 from the Federal Paycheck Protection Program, but officials say that 28 full-time seasonal positions will be eliminated. It's one of Illinois' oldest communities. Waukegan lies about 35 miles north of Chicago, not far from the Wisconsin border. It's the largest city in Lake County and has a population of just under 90,000 residents. It's an industrial town with a large working class population. Amanda Vinicky joins us now live from Waukegan to report on how the city is coping with the coronavirus pandemic. Amanda. Brandis, Waukegan has seen at least 124 cases of COVID-19. That is the highest in Lake County, which is nearly four times that of surrounding Collar counties. Mayor Sam Cunningham says there are several reasons for that, including that many of the community's residents, residents of this blue collar town, are essential workers who can't work from home. The restaurant workers, the factory drivers, the uh, maintenance, utilities. These are the people who live in Waukegan, and we're proud of it. Thank you. 
make that to 1,200 cases. Pardon me for that. Now, by the way, that is the latest of the, uh, there have been more recent issues here, including the collapse of a culvert that caused a sinkhole in one of Waukegan's main thoroughfares. And then on Sunday, the year anniversary of an explosion at a silicone plant that killed four people. Fire Captain Matt Burleson is also in charge of the community's emergency response. He says, yes, while Keegan has seen its fair share of these terrible issues, and he says while he wishes the community hadn't had to have gone through it, it did leave them prepared for this pandemic. We have people that translate all their normal social media posts into, into Spanish. We have uh, added to our testing site more Spanish speakers to do the screening. We can identify that as an issue right away. So I think right now, the 60085 area code's got 57% of their positives are Hispanic, which fits the population. So we, we knew that was about right. Now, he mentioned drive through testing, a site just opened in Waukegan on Sunday. So, yeah, just yesterday. And that is free. Anybody can get a test if they have symptoms for COVID-19. Also, essential workers, healthcare workers, first responders who don't feel sick can receive one of these tests. But there's a limit of 500 a day. And officials say they do believe that they are going to reach that limit. Now, also in high demand, masks, especially those N95 respiratory masks that are needed by healthcare workers to prevent them from getting sick from COVID-19 patients when they're working with them. And that is where a facility here in Waukegan comes into play. This is a sort of pop up in one of the community's industrial parks. It is run by Ohio based Battelle, and it is one of six locations in the United States that decontaminates used masks using vaporized hydrogen peroxide. Justin Sanchez is a researcher with Battelle and he says this is something the company first started investigating in 2016. We had the data, we had the know-how, we had the early proof of concept. But what happened since that kind of uh, eureka moment was that you had to turn it into a real capability that could be put into the field. And that's what happened in just a handful of days. And here is how it works. Hospitals can send, they can either drop off or FedEx use masks and within 72 hours, they will be sent back to those hospitals. When we visited, however, no chambers were running. That's because the this site has the ability to decontaminate thousands more masks a day than they are currently doing. So again, nursing homes, healthcare facilities are very much encouraged to mail or to drop off used masks to be contaminated. There are some that aren't eligible, any of those that have makeup on the inside. But if you do send them in, Battelle uses a particular tracking system. So masks will be returned to the hospitals from which they came, even perhaps to the departments or if a doctor or a nurse writes their name on the mask in front using a Sharpie or something, you may even get your very own mask returned. Again, that is a 72 hour turnaround period for that. Now, just nearby is Big Eddie's Barbecue. You know, especially in times like right now, everything is changing so much. You want to at least be able to say, I can still go to, go to Big Ed's and get my pulled pork sandwich. Even though the world is on fire and everybody's, you know, this pandemic is real and it's changed our lives, I can still come to that place and see those people and get that kind of treatment like family because it helps say, you know what, maybe it's not as bad. Like all other restaurants, Big Ed's is now closed to dine-in customers. That means they're no longer hosting Friday night concerts and fun. Big Ed there says that he truly does miss seeing his customers, misses seeing their smiles, now covered by masks and barbecue dripping down kids' chins. But he says that he does appreciate customers who keep on returning, who want to keep mom and pop shops like his alive. He says that customers have been coming in for a pickup, including this weekend when some held a sort of impromptu tailgate in the parking lot.
and I will be back with more later. Thanks so much, and Brenda, back to you. Amanda, thank you. We'll see you in a bit. And now to Phil Ponce and a look at the state of the economy. Phil. Brenda, some 30 million people have filed for unemployment in the past six weeks since the onset of the coronavirus pandemic. While many states, including Illinois, are still under stay-at-home orders, Others are trying to slowly reopen their economies. But how soon will consumers get back to their old spending habits? On Fox News yesterday, White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow was bullish about the economic future in light of the stimulus measures. Those incentives right. will remain, and we will build on those incentives so that coming off of this pandemic, we could have one of the greatest economic growth rates in American history in 2021 next year. That is a possibility. Joining us now to give us their assessment of the country's future economic prospects are Elijah Brewer. He's chair of the Department of Finance at DePaul University. Prior to joining DePaul, Brewer was an assistant vice president in the research department of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. And Jacob Robbins, assistant professor of economics at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where his research includes macroeconomics, monetary policy, and issues of inequality. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. And let's get a reaction to what we just heard the uh, economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, say that he thinks 2021 could potentially be uh, a spectacular year for the economy. Elijah Brewer, how do you see it? I don't think it's going to be that sp spectacular. Uh, and when we first started this uh, response to the uh, pandemic, I thought the second quarter would be uh, extraordinarily negative. Uh, and with the third quarter rebound rebounding, uh, as, as Larry said, spectacular. But I don't think so. I think people are going to be somewhat hesitant to jump in with you know, both feet. Uh, and, and spending the same way that they did prior to the pandemic, I think it's going to take some time before the economy restarts itself. I think the Federal Reserve is going to keep interest rates at a very, very low level for an extended period of time, much like uh, coming out of the Great, the, the great Recession. And so I, don't, I, I think it's not as rosy as Larry wants to project the economy. It's going to be a, a very painful uh, experience for a lot of small businesses, a lot of uh, uh, consumers who have been laid off or furloughed. And so it's not going to snap back that quickly. It's going to be a much, much, much more gradual approach to the recovery. And maybe in the, in the, in the third quarter, you might see some positive up, uptick, but nothing as spectacular as what Larry has portrayed it to be. What Jacob Robbins, about how about it? How do you see uh, the timing of when there might be a meaningful economic comeback? The way that I see it is that we're not going to have an economic recovery until the virus is under control. And it's not clear at all that the virus is under control right now. In fact, the White House's own estimates are showing that deaths per day are actually going to increase to potentially 3,000 per day. I don't see this snapback of consumer spending when we still have essentially an uncontrolled pandemic throughout the country. And Jacob so Robbins, I'll stick with you for a second. Uh, Jacob Robbins, I'll stick with you for a second. Sec uh, second. Uh, more on your response to the effectiveness of the stimulus measures so far. So I think, you know, so far, I think we've had a good start. You know, the $1,200 payment, this is helping to you know, put money in people's pockets, helping consumer spending. So that was definitely a positive. $600 a week unemployment, this is also a good first step because, you know, we have now potentially 30 million unemployed. We need, we need these people to get an income. They need to be able to spend. They need to be able to buy, put food on the table. So a good first step, but we're not done. We have governments all over the country right now that have huge budget deficits, like Illinois. Pritzker says we have something like $2.5 billion deficit. So if the next stimulus is not going to put get monies back to the government, you know, this could potentially be a big problem going into the next year or so if governments are laying off a lot of workers. Elijah Brewer, uh, 30 million people have filed for uh, unemployment since the pandemic began, as has been referenced a couple of times already. How reliable is that figure? Do you trust it? Oh, yeah, I do. It's only going to get bigger. 
and it's you know and you know it's only the tip of the iceberg. And if you take a look at some of the forecasts for um, for April unemployment numbers, I mean, you're talking about spectacular, and we, we're talking about numbers that we haven't even seen, uh, especially in my lifetime, and not since the Great Depression. And so, thirty million dollars, thirty million uh, unemployed. I think it's going to approach forty million before all the, all is said and done. And that's a that's a big portion of the labor force. Not only you know people are becoming unemployed, but they're actually withdrawn from the labor force, and those individuals are not even counted uh, in the in the numbers. Jacob Robbins, let's talk about uh, businesses. Uh, what businesses are most at risk of not surviving? So right now, it's going to be retail that's under the greatest threat. With stores closing, they're not getting the revenue that they used to. The spending on apparel is actually down about 50%. And we're already seeing the beginning of this. So J. Crew filed for unemployment this morning. And I think we're going to see some of the other department stores potentially follow in its wake. Uh, Elijah Brewer, so much uh, of the recovery depends on how consumers react. Uh, how do you think consumers will react in states where the economy is being uh, reopened in stages in some cases? For example, Georgia, what consumer behavior do you expect? I can only tell you, Phil, how I would react to reopening of the economy in the, in the state of Illinois. You know, I would be somewhat hesitant I would be very cautious. I mean, I wouldn't be spending in the same way that I did before. In fact, I know Jacob talked about some of the stimulus that, that households and businesses have received. Uh, many households may take the opportunity of saving that stimulus and not spending it at all. So I don't think that you know, we're gonna come back and snap back as quickly as people think we are or we will uh, once we start to reopen the economy. It's going to be a very, very slow, slow improvement as we go forward. It's not going to be that sort of sudden jump back, as we saw with the shock. It's going to people are going to be somewhat skeptical and uncertain about have we really made the turn for the better here? I mean, this virus is very serious, and if we don't take it serious, then we could actually have a, a second wave, and that second wave could be more severe than the first one. Jacob Robbins, in terms of consumer behavior, uh, Elijah Brewer just said that uh, a lot of people might be reluctant to spend money. Uh, in terms of behavior, how reluctant do you think people might be in terms of going to restaurants, going to stores, going out and about? I think they're going to be very reluctant. And if we really want to know what's going to happen in the U.S., I think we could look to other countries that have actually, you know, been able to contain the virus, but we still see some of the same effects on consumer activity in these countries. So take South Korea. They had initially a pretty bad outbreak. They were able to contain it, but we still saw a decline in consumer spending of 40%. So um, I completely agree with Elijah. It's going to be a very slow process, and it's not clear when consumers are going to be confident enough to get back into the restaurants, to get back into the retail stores. And it, it's an open question if they'll ever be comfortable, you know, going to the types of events that they used to go to before this pandemic occurred. Gentlemen, that's where we'll have to leave it. We thank you for your observations, Elijah Brewer and Jacob Robbins. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much. And up next, we check back in with Amanda Vinicky in Waukegan. But first, a look at the weather. And still to come on Chicago tonight, research into whether plasma from recovered COVID-19 patients could offer a cure. Golfing reopens in Illinois with strict social distancing guidelines, but Chicago keeps its public courses closed. Advice for helping kids cope emotionally with the coronavirus pandemic. A visit to the Old Town School of Folk Music for a look at their new ways of teaching music. And details on a new support line designed for physicians on the front lines of COVID-19. But first, we check back in with Amanda Vinicky, who is co-anchoring tonight from North Suburban Waukegan. Amanda. 
Brandis, I'm joined now by the co-chair of Clean Power Lake County, Celeste Flores, and we are, of course, socially distanced. So from over there, I can see beyond you the waterfront. Your organization has been battling to make sure that that is clean for Waukegan residents. What's the problem? Yeah, so we are a group of volunteers and we have been advocating for a just transition for the coal plant that is owned by Energy Energy in our lakefront. And from there, we really became an environmental justice organization that is trying to educate um, and inform our community about our rights to clean air, clean water, and healthy soil. Because there's definitely that legacy of an industrial past that has provided a lot of jobs, but also sort of literally tarnished some of the land and water here. Yeah, so Waukegan has a big history of being an industry and a lot of that industry has left and now we were left with no jobs and we want to make sure that the coal plant, um, that site does not become another super fun site. We have five out of the 13 out of the state located here in Waukegan. So we want to make sure that we are um, planning for a future in a way that our community needs it. Our community is made up of immigrants. It's a working class community and we need to make sure that whatever economic relief comes, um, it comes with jobs in mind that are for our our community. Yeah, about 55%, according to the last census, population of Waukegan is Latino. You have some concerns with whether all Latinos, particularly those for whom English is not their native language, are fully getting an understanding of services available to them when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah, you know, Clean Power Lake County, we are all volunteer run and we have decided to really focus on educating and using our platforms we have for both. Um, our populations of English and Spanish speaking, obviously as a Latina, as a daughter of immigrants, it's really important for my family to understand the concerns. COVID-19 is something, it's a virus that's attacking our lungs. And, you know, being in Waukegan and in Lake County, we already have a lot of health concerns and a lot of things that are going into our air, not only the coal plant, but ethylene oxide that's being emitted and many more other pollutants. So our health is already being compromised and this is only exacerbating that. So we need to make sure that those that prefer and the when your native language is Spanish, that you're getting the information at the same time as our English speakers. So really making sure any information that comes from local municipalities and the county level, no matter what kind of medium they're sending it out in, that it automatically has both English and Spanish for our Spanish speaking community to know how important it is for us to really be careful to be social distancing during this time because we are the ones going out to these jobs. We're still considered essential workers. We're a working class family, working class community. And we need to make sure that if we're going to a job that we're coming home and we're taking all the precautions to make sure we're not contaminating our family members by accident. And is that being done? Are you getting all directions translated into Spanish? And I know I spoke earlier with the mayor who said that one of the other reasons he believes there is a high rate of COVID in this community is because of essential workers, as you noted, but also due to uh, individuals that live in communal settings. Yeah, you know, I think it's really a hit or miss when it comes to information. Some information I do see being um, sent out in Spanish and English, but you know, the last information about you know the happy news that we were going to get a test in a test site here in Waukegan, um, I only saw the information come out in English first. So I know I saw a lot of organizations, groups, and individuals translating that information into Spanish and disseminating it through text, phone calls, social media. Um, so I think there could be a lot more done with both our municipal and our county level. And then we don't have a ton of time left. And you know, this is a complex issue, but you did bring up ethylene oxide that is from the Medline plant that does sterilization of medical equipment, which of course is at a premium these days when we're seeing so many people needing health care because of COVID-19. How do you reconcile that and any kind of brief statements in terms of what has been done to lower the emissions of ETO? Yeah, we were able to pass some legislation that is able to put a limit on how much ethylene oxide is being emitted in the state. But I think once again, it goes back to economics, to jobs, right? We need jobs in our community. We're a working class community, but let's make sure that those jobs are jobs that are not going to affect us in our health. And we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much to Celeste Flores of Clean Power Lake County. And Brandis, back to you. Amanda, long history of uh, environmental work there, it sounds like. Thank you. Up next, how the blood of recovered coronavirus patients may help those struggling with the disease. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd, powering lives.
We have a tremendous source of untapped, efficient energy right here in our school. Let her rip, Jenny. I kind of love this idea. <laughs> the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program has real ideas for making schools energy efficient. Patients who've recovered from the coronavirus may have something special to help current patients recover as well, and it's in their blood. Researchers are studying the use of convalescent plasma therapy, and it's already showing positive results at Weiss Memorial Hospital in Uptown. Joining us to share their knowledge about that treatment are Dr. Maria Lucia Marariaga, the surgeon leading the plasma trials at the University of Chicago Medicine, and Dr. Suzanne Pham, the medical director at the co of the COVID-19 response team at Weiss Memorial Hospital. Doctors, welcome both of you to Chicago tonight. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So Dr. Pham, let's start with you, please. Kind of walk us through briefly what is convalescent plasma and how is it administered to patients? So convalescent plasma is plasma obtained from patients who have had COVID-19 infection. Uh, during the acute phase of infection, the body mounts an immune response and develops antibodies. And what our hope is that from these patients who have recovered from the infection itself, the antibodies found in their plasma can be used to help patients who are uh, going through the acute phase of illness and helping them recover in a more timely fashion. Um, and just for our viewers at home, we've got a little bit of a freezing of you there, Dr. Pham, but we can hear you great, which is super important. Um, Dr. Marayaga, how is University of Chicago um, studying or how are you all involved in studying the effectiveness of this treatment? Well, at University of Chicago, we design a translational project where we are collaborating closely with the Department of Medicine um, and Antibody Laboratory in the section of Immunology and Department of Surgery and Transplant Institute because in giving convalescent plasma, we can actually understand a lot of immunological mechanisms at the same time that we're trying to help patients in the hospital. So all along the way, we are collecting samples from the convalescent plasma donors, as well as the recipients, so that we can understand how convalescent plasma works, what is the best way to give it, and what is um, the best treatment dose to give to patients. And currently, how is it given? Uh, currently, convalescent plasma at our hospital is given as one unit of plasma transfused into a patient. Okay. And Dr. Pham, how did Weiss come to be involved in using this therapy? So as we were looking into treatment options for our patients with COVID-19, uh, it, it came to us that convalescent plasma was being studied um, around the world as an option for treatment. So we started looking into how we could acquire the convalescent plasma here at our institution. We're a community hospital in Chicago and uh, we, we don't have the same resources as some of our bigger universities that it centers do around the city. So uh, I, I, as I was looking around at our options, it came to me that uh, the Mayo Clinic was leading a study that was uh, being funded by BARDA and the US government. And through the Mayo Clinic-led uh, expanded access protocol, uh, we enrolled ourselves very quickly and was able to find ourselves um, uh, with access. And it's been a remarkable uh, partnership with the American Red Cross here in Chicago and with Mayo Clinic, because within a week of requesting our first unit of plasma, we had it infused in one of our patients. And uh, that patient thankfully did very, very well with this unit. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit more about that patient? What can you tell us, of course, um, when you say very well, how, how did that patient recover or is recovering? So this was a patient uh, in their 40s who had been in our hospital for a week uh, with moderate to severe symptoms related to COVID-19. And despite all the therapeutic options this patient had been given, they were not improving. Once we were able to get the plasma within 24 hours, we started seeing significant improvements in this patient's ability to oxygenate. Uh, the nurse called me the morning after the infusion was given and told me that uh, they were able to wean down on this patient's oxygen already after all these other options had been tried previous to the plasma infusion. Within three days of receiving the plasma, the patient was discharged on no oxygen at all. Okay. 
Um, and Dr. Madariaga, from your perspective, what do we know so far about the effectiveness of, of convalescent plasma therapy? How is it working where you are? Well, I think overall it's um, encouraging, but it's difficult to have any firm conclusions about the efficacy of convalescent plasma. Uh, right now, the trials that are up and running um, don't have control groups for us to compare what is uh, the effect of treatment. So what we are seeing, though, is that convalescent plasma appears to be safe. The patients who receive it don't suffer any side effects. Uh, what is needed in further studies down the line and that are up, uh, starting to come up and running are controlled studies to where we can determine how efficacious convalescent plasma is. And this is, Dr. Mar Madariaga, I just also wanted to ask, this has been used before, this treatment. Correct. So basically, um, at the turn of the century, it was used, um, for example, in school children who needed to prevent outbreaks of measles. And then going along through the years, it's been used in influenza and other respiratory virus illnesses. Currently in this day and age, um, there have been several reports coming from Asia, several from China and one from South Korea, showing their experience in using convalescent plasma therapy in patients who are severely sick with COVID-19. And those all show promising results. And, and Dr. Pham, you know, you mentioned that you all are a smaller community hospital. Maybe you don't have all the resources that University of Chicago has, but why is it important um, that a hospital like Weiss is able to, uh, to use this treatment as well and participate? We absolutely pride ourselves on being an academic institution. We do have a robust internal medicine residency program here at Weiss. And, you know, because of that, we've always strived to stay as up to date as possible and be able to have the same treatment options uh, for our patients, no matter what disease condition uh, they may be coming into the hospital with. Uh, COVID-19 uh, was, is being considered uh, a disease condition that we feel we can do our best to provide uh, as many treatment options as possible. And uh, we have partnerships with many of our university centers around the city. Many of us trained at these same university centers and we have maintained connections um, with colleagues there. And, you know, this, this truly has been an experience of we are all in this together. Every institution has just been so uh, kind and and sharing with their protocols that they've developed with more resources than us and hence has allowed us to truly tap into the same for our own patient population. For that, we are so grateful. All right, and we'll have to leave it there. My thanks to Dr. Maria Lucia Madariaga and Dr. Suzanne Pham. Thanks to you both and best of luck in the treatment efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Golfers in Illinois were kept off courses for more than one month until May 1st. That's when Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker allowed golf clubs to open under strict social distancing rules. But not every municipality, namely Chicago, is game for opening their courses just yet. Chicago Tonight's Evan Garcia visited two golf courses just north of the city that opened this weekend. In terms of social distancing goes, I think this is the most spread out you can be in any sport. So I think. And just so. keep that social distancing. It's only like two club lengths away here, you know? Golf is back in Illinois, at some courses at least. For the weekends, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, our, we are at absolute max capacity from 6.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. The Glen Club in Glenview, about 15 miles northwest of Chicago, is one of several golf courses reopening May 1st under specific guidelines per Illinois' COVID-19 stay-at-home order. The biggest changes is going from foursomes, you know, traditional four players in a group, to two players only. Our tee time intervals here used to be uh, 10 minutes and are normally 10 minutes apart here. They've now had to been changed to 15 minutes. Spacing out smaller groups deters human contact. Illinois' rules for reopening golf courses range from closing all pro shops and clubhouses to no handshakes. I've talked to several golfers out here after the round and you know they feel like this is a safe space. They can come get out, get some fresh air, not come within six feet of staff or their playing partner. One big adjustment Illinois golfers are making this month is not using these. All golfers must travel by foot to maintain social distancing. I think it's better than nothing, so I'll take it. We agree with the rules. I would rather have a cart, play my music, and have a cocktail. 
The Chicago Park District is keeping its golf courses closed for the month of May. So Chicagoans like Danny Steinberg are leaving the city limits to play around. I'm glad I have a dad who belongs to a uh, suburban club. I think at this point I'm going to hit a pitching wedge over the tree onto the green. Golfing at the 18-hole course in Glenview can get pretty pricey. Seven miles southeast of here is Skokie Park District's Weber Park Golf Course, a much smaller yet affordable course that also opened May 1st. Our nine-hole par three golf course was built in 1974. Been a lot of heavy traffic the last few days, and we expect that's going to continue at least for the next couple of weeks. Lifelong golfer Candy Spreckman couldn't wait to hit the green. Oh, I've always loved golf. The next shot is going to be the best shot in the world. And the sound of the ball hitting the cup, you know, it's just, it's continuously rewarding. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Evan Garcia. And in case you were wondering where the face masks were in that story, state guidelines indicate golfers do not need to wear face coverings as long as they are six feet from other people. You can read Illinois' rules for golfing during the month of May on our website. And now we check back in with Amanda Vinicky, who is co-anchoring tonight from North Suburban Waukegan. Amanda. Verandas, I'm joined now by Hamas Ibrahim. He is with the Urban Muslim Minority Alliance. It's a social service organization. What sort of work do you do? We actually provide as many resources as possible to the Lake County community. Uh, we have a food pantry. We teach GED classes. We offer English as a second language, uh, ESL classes. We pretty much try to have any basic need that the community needs served. Uh, we've been around for going on. This is our 15th year. We started out church, uh, teaching GED classes and then we moved on, added a food pantry and started with a career link job readiness program. And from there, we basically just uh, extended each program to help the community as much as needed. And how have you seen the need increase or at least change during the coronavirus pandemic? <laughs> Prior to the pandemic, we had our food pantry open once a week from 10 to 3. Since then, we've had to add an additional day and add uh, probably double, if not tripled, our food amount that we give out to the community. So right now, we're in the process of trying to apply for more grants so we can keep that up and keep serving the community as much as needed. What are you hearing from people as they are seeking help? Is they're seeking really food for their families? Yeah, I mean, that's basically it. You know, uh, um, quite a few of the other pantries in the area are not able to provide food or they've just closed down. So we're trying to add or help out and fill that void as much as possible. A lot of people are having trouble either finding a new job if they've been laid off and even if they haven't found a new job, they've had trouble basically being able to feed their family. And yet, do you have to change the way that you go about things at the pantry due to social distancing guidelines, fear force of, yes. of the spread of the virus? Yes, so prior to the uh, pandemic, we were allowing people to come in and basically pick food off the shelves and pack their own bags. Now we are preparing the bags prior to them coming in and getting them ready, so basically it's just a handoff process. Once they come in, we can hand them the bags and then they can basically go about their day. And then other social service work, the GEDs, has that come to a halt or are you continuing, but again, adapting and sort of doing that perhaps virtually? So yes, so basically we've changed. So there are no classes going on. The only We're only open for the food pantry and we've gone to virtual classes for our GED programs and we're starting to try to see if we can adapt to more programs going online, you know, the Spanish classes and uh, job readiness uh, programs as well. Uh, and obviously we are here in Waukegan. Can you tell us a bit about this community in general and why it is that the, the food pantry, these services are necessary here and in Lake County? So uh, Lake County, in this general area, there are, there's a huge African-American and Hispanic population. and it's been underserved, so to say, and the community, the mayor, everyone has stepped up and just wants to pitch in and make Waukegan a thriving community again. 
What about your own organization? A lot of not-for-profits and charities are hurting. They're getting fewer donations. They're trying to do more, and at the same time, they themselves have less finances, even perhaps volunteers who are able to help out. So how is it, what is the status of your organization? So we're, we're doing okay, uh, you know, we're, with the pandemic and with this also being the month of Ramadan, our need to be able to get out and reach the community has been a little harder. So we're relying more on social media and getting word of mouth to see if we can raise more donations. Right now, we've actually received a $100,000 donation that's going to be matched for the month of Ramadan dollar for dollar so it's people like that have been helping keep us going so and volunteers a grant from where or can you share that I cannot All right. <laughs> we, uh, it was anonymous a so I, who, a I don't doer. even I don't even know it was anonymous so yeah <laughs> Is um, it we are working with the Zakat Chicago and the CIOGC to try to procure more grants for our food pantry and our other GED programs. We're in the process of adding more uh, part-time staff so we can help with the, the uh, food pantry as well. Well, thank you so very much. Again, that was Hamas Ibrahim. He is with the Urban Muslim Minority Alliance. And now, Brandis, back to you. I'm sure they're hopeful and, and uh, expect that that amount of money, that donation will be helpful. Amanda, thank you. Up next, how to help kids cope during the state's stay-at-home order. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight podcast and subscribe. The coronavirus pandemic has and continues to change everyone's lives. Now that includes school aged children, most of whom have seen their entire lives upended. And as the days of social distancing have turned into months, the anxiety and frustration is mounting. For teenagers missing milestone celebrations, to middle schoolers missing their friends, and little ones missing their local playground. Here to talk about how children are experiencing the pandemic and how parents can help see them through it is Dr. Alexandra Solomon, clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Northwestern University and a licensed clinical psychologist at the Family Institute at Northwestern University. Welcome back to Chicago tonight. Good to see you. Well, good to be with you in this, in this <laughs> format, you. at least. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so first, tell us kind of what changes uh, are we seeing in our children's mental health and behavior right now? So broadly speaking, we are seeing either a wider range in our kids' behavioral expression and emotional expression or restricted range. So sometimes, sometimes we think about kids as either falling into the internalizing camp where they may be getting more depressed more anxious, more sort of flat slash numb, or our kids may be falling in that externalizing camp where it's more external. You're seeing more complaining, more whining, more anger, more outbursts, more behavioral challenges. But basically it's, we're seeing shifts and our kids, like all of us, play out our emotions in our behaviors. And so it's, it's fully expected that we're seeing shifts and changes during this time. And maybe also some regression, meaning that kids are falling back on some ways of being in the world that we as parents thought they had outgrown. And sometimes it's kind of sweet, right? They're finding toys they had let go of or returning to movies that they used to love. But sometimes it's, it's not quite sweet. It's, it's annoying or it's worrisome when we're seeing behaviors emerge, wanting to sleep with parents or near parents or losing skills they had gained. But again, that regression, that sort of going backwards is expected under the kind of stress that we're all living through at this moment. Are there behaviors that might signal uh, more serious problems down the road even? I mean, certainly whenever a family feels like they're getting to the point where the behavior is outpacing a family system's ability to cope, that's a great time to reach out for some additional support. So even though you might be able to say, my kid's depressed because their whole world, as you said, has been turned upside down, it doesn't mean we can't also start to ask questions about therapy or about getting some extra help. Um, how much information should we be giving kids right now? You know, it is definitely dependent on the kid and on their age. So I really do want to encourage parents to be honest, but maybe think about sort of essential truth. What is the bare minimum we can say 
um, while still being honest, right? We don't want to act as if there's not something happening that is happening. And we want to make sure that we aren't flooding our kids. So at least, for example, in our home, even though our kids are teenagers, we just turn the TV off when they come in the room because we don't need that additional, you know, we have that Chiron now always about the number of infections and the number of deaths. And we just don't, we're mindful to not have our kids be bombarded all the time with that information. But we also do open the door for them asking questions. Sometimes if, if parents aren't taking the lead and normalizing that we can talk about this, then kids feel like it's somehow taboo or they can't ask questions. So I think it really is great for parents to say something like, do you have any questions or what's on your mind lately? You know, now that we're in whatever week we're in, week seven, how are you feeling? What questions do you have for me? I think it's great for parents to say something like, I'd rather have you ask me than Google it on your phone because then we as parents can have a bit of discernment about how we translate all that information into packageable bits for our kids. Is there uh, an age group that might be more at risk for mental health issues from the shutdown? You know, I think that's an interesting question. I don't, when I think about it, I think less about the developmental age of the kids who are most at risk and more about the size of any individual kid's safety net. So the kids I worry most about are the kids whose parents don't have the kind of safety net we want them to have, right? We talk in our the field of therapy, we talk about the importance of regulating the regular, re, sorry, regulating the regulator, meaning the more calm and supported a parent is, the more calm and supported a kid is going to feel. And so I worry most about family systems where the parents are right there on the brink, where they are facing economic hardship, where they don't have reliable employment, housing, healthcare, because kids end up being the collateral damage. So it's where I start thinking about social policy and how much our social policy needs to be designed to support families. Because as I said, it's the kids who then end up paying the price when their parents are spending their days terrified, scared, stressed out, um, and unable to make ends meet, then it's kids' emotional well-being that ends up being sort of the end of the line for that. Well, and on that note, what resources are there for families, um, especially those who are low-income families or uh, families whose uh, children, the parents, maybe they are essential workers or frontline workers, what kind of resources exist to help those, the children in those families? It is, it's definitely beautiful to see how family systems and neighborhoods are stepping up to, um, to tag in, to provide relief, to be on Zoom calls with kids, to offer tutoring. I've heard stories about grandmas offering tutoring to little ones, and that way they're sort of occupied for a bit um, via Zoom. But I also think about the sort of air resources we have in the Chicagoland area. And one great resource is where I've been working for decades now, which is the Family Institute. And we have a clinic with sliding scale therapy services, individual couple family therapy services that are um, that are accessible and we are really committed and have been for decades. We've been committed to providing mental health therapy services um, in a way that is really all access, all inclusive. And we are offering teletherapy now. The whole world of therapists have you know very quickly moved from face to face to uh, screen to screen as, as you and I are doing now. And before I let you go, we've just got a little bit of time left. Maintaining a routine, it is really hard for all of us, uh, but how can that be helpful for children? It sure is helpful. You know, parents are kids' lighthouses, you know, like the sort of flashing light in the storm. And so even if the day has been crazy, if kids can anchor into the fact that they know they've got an Uno game with their parent at night or a walk around the block, like just those rituals help us regulate. They, they downshift our nervous system. They help us feel like there's at least these sorts of like pebbles on my path. And so I love the idea of families both being very gentle with themselves, that things are in upheaval and finding really simple things, even if it's just Uno or even if it's just a walk as having those little touch points during the day. All right, it's a good place to leave it. And we should point out that on tomorrow's program, we will take a look at mental health concerns for the elderly as well. Now, Alexandra Solomon, thank you again for joining us tonight. Great to be with you. The Old Town School of Folk Music has been a Chicago institution since it opened in 1957. The school has grown beyond acoustic guitars and banjos to teach everything from African dance to music appreciation for babies. And they recently went from teaching zero online classes to 100% online classes in just a matter of days. Arts producer Mark Vitale stopped by to see how they've tuned in to the new normal.
Little birdie, little birdie. My name is uh, Jonas Friddle, and I teach strings. So fiddle, banjo, guitar, mandolin, uh, and ensemble classes uh, across ages, so as young as five to 75. Ensemble and private lessons are now all online. It's a first for a school that has resisted online instruction. It's a very large uh, change. You know, the teachers and the staff uh, really went at it and, and worked hard and I think managed in just a week's time to, to make a shift. Sometimes When he isn't teaching, Jonas is accustomed to playing with fellow musicians on stage in front of an audience. We caught up with him in the empty concert hall on the school's main campus, which is closed for the shutdown. We're experiencing the same challenges that uh, everybody is. Uh, I have a couple of small children, so my wife and I are both working from home, and, uh, and we have the kids right there with us popping into our uh, online meetings whenever they, uh, you know, need another pretzel. Elsewhere in the building, silent classrooms, an empty lobby, and a music store that is now open for curbside pickups. This is a very weird time, but we're doing pretty well. Uh, Old Town has been able to take more than 70% of its classes online. Um, and while a lot of people have been impacted in some way, 90, I believe, percent of our teachers are still able to teach at least some of their classes. And even though the school doesn't look like it used to, they are confident there will be some return to normal. The future, it, it's going to be different no matter what. Uh, we still want to have the bricks and mortar classes and that in-person experience available here for everybody who loves it and it's so important to them. And they have found that they can expand their reach online. If there's a silver lining to this, uh, it's this thing that we were always kind of afraid of. Uh, going online has proven uh, to be a lifeline. Whether online or in person, the Old Town School remains a community. These people are, are like family to me and to each other. And so to be able to see those people um, in the ways that are possible right now are, are very important to them and to be able to uh, keep music in their life. It's very important, um, I think, to have that right now, any way that we can get it. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. And I'll meet her in the sky. And on our website, you can watch the full video of teacher Jonas Friddle playing his arrangement of a traditional folk tune, plus more on the Old Town School of Folk Music. Up next, details on a support line for physicians. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash daily briefing and sign up. You've heard the saying, doctors make the worst patients. In times like this especially, it may be hard for physicians to process the emotional toll of caring for dying COVID-19 patients. And to help their fellow doctors, a group of psychiatrists has started a national support line for physicians. Here to tell us more about it is WTTW News reporter Kristen Tometz. Hey again, Kristen. Hi, Brandis. So first tell us, what is the physician support line? Well, the physician support line is basically what it sounds like. It's a free national support line that doctors can call from 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. daily to talk with the psychiatrist. And why is it needed? Why did they want to, the folks who made it, why did they want to focus on doctors? Sure. Well, doctors, like other healthcare workers, are seeing and experiencing, you know, difficult situations responding to COVID-19. And psychiatrists say doctors are trained to handle these difficult situations. And part of that training involves kind of setting their emotions to the side. So they may have a difficult time opening up about their experiences they're having now as it relates to the pandemic, or they don't really feel like they have anyone they can talk to without spreading more fear. And so what do the doctors need to do to access this support? So all the doctors have to do is call the, call the number. It's 888-409-0141 from 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. daily, and they can talk with 
um, a psychiatrist who's trained to give them, you know, some information and talk about what their feelings and help them process things. And it's really just a way to let doctors know that it's okay. They can talk and there's no shame in asking for help. Okay, Kristen Tometz, thank you. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read more about Kristen's story on our website, as well as find resources for other healthcare professionals and anyone else who may need emotional support during the pandemic. That's at WTTW.com news. And that is our show for this Monday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com news. You can also watch the show via podcast and get it on the PBS video app. And please do join us tomorrow night live at 7 p.m. That's right. Congresswoman Robin Kelly on health care disparities in underserved communities and how a musician is remixing a Chicago classic to encourage everyone to stay at home. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Amanda Vinicky. Thanks for watching. Please do stay healthy and stay safe. Good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm, proud to be named in the 2020 edition of the Best Lawyers in America.